Tonight on Plus Politics, we address the issue of cost of governance in Nigeria and calls for amendments to fit it into the national budget. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anton. Joining us tonight is Tunji Abdulhamid. He is a legal practitioner. He's also uh, a member of the People's Democratic Party. And also joining us tonight is uh, Ade Atobatele. He's a public affairs analyst. I hope I didn't murder you today. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always a tough sister for me. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, let me start with you, Tunji. Um, as a member of the opposition party, uh, looking at the issue of cost of governance, many Nigerians will first and foremost blame the People's Democratic Party, who has held, who have held sway uh, in governments for 16 plus years, um, and many would say have led the way or the path of uh, a very flamboyant political lifestyle that many have decided. And they all want to be career politicians because of what they've seen um, or how they've seen politicians grow um, from nobodies to very rich men when they leave offices. Um, should people in the PDP um, have anything to say about the cut cutting of the cost of governance being that they're the trailblazers of making money or money politics in the first instance? Uh, uh, Mary, uh, I think... Uh if you are talking about the uh, PDP here, we are not we are not we are not being sincere to ourselves because uh, if you look at APC, look at uh, NMPP, look at the uh, PDP, they all almost all of them have uh, either been uh, PDP or, or the other party, and they've all been part of the system. So nobody, you don't talk about the party here. Let's talk about the people around Nigeria, because if you are talking about PDP, we are we are going to be limiting our our, our scope of discussion because um, you can't tell me that eighty uh, percent of those who are in APC today have not been in the PDP before. So the cost of governance is a serious issue that we need to tackle. It's, and it's one of our uh, uh, problems in this country. People in government have seen government as their own uh, personal life, uh, to, just to uh, improve their own personal life instead of service. So people are not saving people. I, I want to say that, look, it's, it's, it's a sad reality that we need to look into. We need to look at the cost of governance. If we reduce the cost of governance, some of the things we are complaining of today will not be there. We are complaining about the subsidy. We are complaining about all the other, other things. We are complaining about lack of money for education, lack of money for aid, lack of money for this and that. But those in government are, are not are not complaining because their salary are increasing every time. Their allowances are increasing every time. Look at the National Assembly. You are, you, they, they take like a 30, 40 million a monthly. Look at the ministers. They they have so many comforts, so many uh, uh, cars and they have been purchased. So in, in fact, in, in a year, you buy about... Uh, one one trillion uh, uh, cars for 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 those in the political offices, and we are yet to complain about lack of money. So yeah, I think to me it's a sad reality that uh, we are we are spending that kind of money to 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 in in, to, to in in governance. Governance is not about spending money alone; it's about spending money for the buses, not for the people in government. But in our own reality here, the money is being spent for people in government. They it's just they see it as their own personal. Uh, money and they can do whatever they, they want to do with it. So for me, I think uh, I agree with you. It's a serious issue. I will need to look into it. Uh, so, uh, Tomatella, let me come to you. Um, now more than ever, every single person uh, thinks that pressure must be put on not just government at the centre, but government across the board, whether it be a council or local government chairman, state governors, houses of assemblies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Knowing that subsidy um, has been removed and of course the cost of leaving is skyrocketing, the pressure that Nigerians have, gone, have had to go through in the space of almost a week, um, should we only be paying lip service to it as we have always done, uh, or sometimes use it as a tool of um, you know political campaign as opposed to pushing for the reduction of cost of governance? Cost of governance starts when I say I want to run for a position. Um, it costs money to run for the position. The party does not allow, does not um, fund you in running. You fund yourself. Maybe mm -hmm. if you're very lucky, your constituents might um, might um, um, give you some money or whatever. Basically, it's funding. It's self-funded, and nobody spends money to put it down the drain into a big hole, a black hole. So you go there, and the first thing you do is, how do I recoup? So the cost of governance starts with the fundamental rot 
that is inside the procedure that creates the people that go there with the mindset that I cannot leave this place poorer than I got in. My people wouldn't even expect me to leave poorer than I got in because they expect some sort of largesse to come from me. That, that, is, all, that is now given into the, into the form of constituency projects, whether it's a borehole or whether it's a road or whatever. So the whole system is geared towards largesse. And until we, until we fundamentally change that system, there is no reduction in cost of governance. It's just, it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a mythical unicorn. You cannot say I'm, I'm supposed to spend this money and then when I get there, um, I'm going to come out poor and nobody does that. In fact, what you'll find is that nobody wants to run. No. It's interesting. Um, I always ask when everybody says, or when people come up with the idea of, oh, well, it's, it, it's costly, it's expensive, and people are part of the reason why politicians steal. But you brought up that idea that there has to be a largesse one way or the other, because if you are given constituency projects, you're supposed to deliver and give account, but that doesn't happen half the time. So somebody must have introduced money politics or people waking up in the morning and lining up in front of a politician's house to beg for money. Somebody must have set that example, right? That's quite correct. I say the, the problem is the, the disconnect between the party and the, par the person running for a particular office. In a, I've, I've done politics on four, three continents now. And in most other places, the part of the person is sponsored by the party. Here, the party wants you to sponsor them. The candidate needs to sponsor the party. It's the complete opposite way around. In other places, um, in other in other climes, even in places like Kenya, the, um, you know, the party sponsors their candidate as far as they can go, and they, they, you do it at local level, national level, and everything is 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 sponsored along that line. But when you're asking an individual to to fund that particular process you cannot you cannot ask him to give that money away this is money that he this is money that uh, would be generational wealth for his family this is generational wealth for his his community and you've asked him to give it away and they should now come out poorer the whole process is upside down so when you now say cost of governance well the cost of governance is maintaining this particular system so unless it stops you cannot you cannot you cannot um prune branches and believe that they're not going to grow back you need to uproot mm. the whole system yeah let me come back to you Tunji. um at the beginning of the bahari administration there was something that seemed like um a move in the right direction and many nigerians supported the fact that the president and the vice president had promised that they were going to uh, cut their uh, salaries in two they promised um, that they were going to make sure that they reduced the cost of governance. But that seems like window dressing. Uh, compare, fast forward from then till now, has there been any change whatsoever? Sunji, that question for you. I think you're muted. Somehow. Okay. Can you repeat yourself? Yes, yeah, so I'm saying that at the beginning of the Buhari administration, there seemed to be a move by the president and the vice president to slash their salaries, their, their earnings um, by 50%. And they said they were trying to lead by example. Um, but fast forward that to now, I mean, they have obviously left office today. Can we say that they really lived up to expectations in terms of crossing the cost of governance or was just that some sort of window dressing uh, to make the president and his vice look good? I think uh, that uh, you can't say they've, uh, they only make attempts. That's what they did. They, it was an attempt for them to say, look, we want to do this. It's just like, just, just like you said, it's the window dressing as far as I'm concerned. And uh, if we talk about the uh, cost of governance, the salary is not what the issue we're talking about here. 50% of the salary is nothing. The, what we're talking about is allowances. The allowance is in the, in the area where things are, where, where the toko is. You know, when you travel abroad as a, as a president or you travel within, within Nigeria, you collect uh, allowances and all those things. But those are not being reduced. They still collect and they still do other things. So they buy things that are not necessary. They, in other countries, the uh, president don't, don't even, they don't even feed the president. He buys, he pays for, for his, for his feeding and some other. But in Nigeria, you project millions of naira uh, for our president and the uh, deputy and the uh, whoever that, and, and his family. 
to, 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 and, there, and there is no reduction in it. In fact, it increases every year. Uh, throughout their, uh, it, 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 it was increasing every year throughout their tenure. So as far, as far as I'm concerned, there was no any attempt in that regard. They only make a, just a paper, 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 paper policy. As far as I'm concerned, they just made a statement on, on paper for record purposes. And then they, in action, there was nothing done in that regard. Because I am aware, this, they, we, we, nobody can even tell me the, the amount of money spent by our president abroad for medical. Nobody can tell us what the amount they, 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 the amount budgeted for for their for their feeding at Asorot and other things like that. So as far as I'm concerned, they, there was no any attempt, serious attempt in that in that regard. What they did was just a paper a policy, and uh, and there was no any implementation to that towards that uh, actualization of that uh, policy. As far as I'm concerned, so reduction of a fifty percent of salary it, it will not go anywhere because the salary is not is nothing to write, to write on about. It's not the issue we're talking about here. I think um. Because when we have these conversations, it's not enough for us to put out the facts and say these are the problems. Let's talk solutions. Before we even begin to say we want to cut the cost of governance, we need to obviously find out what the root cause of this um, bloated um, budgets and you know uh, monies that we have allocated to different you know spheres of, spheres of government. Um, where do we even start? Because you talk about accountability, we're lacking in that regard. Um, just a few days after handover, the series of probes, EFCC is going after a lot of people, um, asking questions. Even before the end of the Buhari administration, there were so many question marks that, you know, are yet to get answers. Um, so where do we start to deal with this before we say, finally, governments at all levels are going to cut the cost of governors? Where do we start? From? My, my apologies for that. The problem in government is oversight. When the government was originally um, designed, all the special advisors and so, they were supposed to give oversight from the presidency into ministries. They've now turned it into a government of their own. Um, we don't have oversight um, in our institutions. And um, as a consequence, people become, um, fief they become fiefdoms. And people are, are very, very wanting to own a fiefdom. But you, I mean, what's the, what does it mean to say, I want a juicy ministry? I mean, that's that's where that's the wording <laughs> alone makes you understand that they understand what what the what the issues are. Um, we need to get to a situation whereby there, there is um, a lot more oversight as to what we spend it on. I mean, we have an activist CBN governor that spent over several trillion naira off budget, and we have no KPIs for that. I mean, how do we do something like that? I mean, because it's inside, it's written into a law. So who's over, who, where was the oversight on the CBN governor when he was spending this money that has no tangible results? This is a, it's all, it all comes down to oversight. Once somebody is told, wait a minute, why are you doing this? Where, where are the results? Where are, where are, where are the plans? Where are all of those things? Then all of a sudden people take a step back. And they say, oh, maybe we're not going to spend this money like we're going to spend it before. The same thing happens when budgets are given and you don't spend all the money coming up to Christmas. Suddenly somebody says, oh, a whole bunch of ghost projects suddenly appear. Because if we don't spend this money this this year, they're not going to give us money next year. So there are, there's a whole mm -hmm. bunch of oversight functions that are failing throughout government, local government, state government, federal government. And if these oversight functions were put back, we have at least a chance to cut back, cut back across the board, objectively. Mm. What are the jobs of uh, the, uh, um, uh, Tunji? What are the jobs of the auditor generals and the accountant generals and and all of the ministries, departments, and agencies that are responsible for accountability that never really again kudos to the the uh, immediate past uh, auditor general. I think he still is the auditor general as we speak who had found a lot of lapses in, you know, the records that had come through his office. He raised alarms, but uh, nothing has necessarily been done again. So should we be looking at willpower here to deal with the issue? Because again, the Buhari administration is one of those administrations that was built on the wings of fighting corruption, having zero tolerance for, gov uh, for, for corruption. But here we are um, at the end of his government in the, in fact, the, at the beginning of another administration um, or still yet to deal with the issue of corruption. So is it political will or are we the people part of the major problems that these politicians have? 
Yeah, it is a political will and a lack of a lack of sincerity and lack of love for the country. That is that. That's why we are we are we are having those kind of situations. And just like he said, uh, we don't have an oversight uh, a, a function. But it's not been carried out by people who are supposed to carry them out. You know, they are they are always collaborating. People who are supposed to do oversight of, over you. They are they are, they are, they, are, they, are, they work to, uh, hand in hand. And that is why you see a president who wants to come in, who want a national assembly uh, senate president that will align with his, uh, whatever he wants to do. And that's why you see them fighting over who becomes uh, uh, the Senate president. And then he must be supported by the president or he must be the president who will nominate who becomes the Senate president. The Senate, the National Assembly is to perform oversight function over the executive. They are supposed to check the executive. And that executive will be the one to appoint that person that will oversight, that will do oversight of, of, on him or that will, that will check his uh, SSCs. That, that it, it, won't, it won't happen. So until we have the political way to do things, they will in line with the law and in line with the interest of the nation, we may be no problem to get it right. Corruption. We keep saying until we have the political will. Why are you a politician and you have no will? What is the, I'm looking for the best way, to, the best word to describe. What is the thing that pushes you? What is the, um, ah, help me. What makes you want to be a politician? I'm guessing that um, it should be for service. But if service is not, you know, part of the plan, then, what will are we ever going to find to make you do the right thing? No, I agree with you. It should be for service. But what we have seen today is people are being idea for their own personal gains. And that's why you see issues. And some most times it's about sentiment, ethnic sentiment, religious sentiment, and political sentiment. You see in, the, in our country, political interest is bigger than national interest. As far as they are concerned, political interest is, is number one. And that's why you see people talking about uh, it must be our parties, uh, this is what our party is looking for. Whether it's in it's interest of the nation or not, once the party is looking for it, they must go with it. So it's, it, I agree with you that it must be about service. It must be about, about, about people. But in reality, what we are seeing today is that people are there just for, for their own personal gains. And that's why we are... We are, we are and unfortunately, again, there are people... They, we, don't, we have people in power who will not even punish people for, for, for committing a, a crime or corruption or we don't have transparency. We are complete, we're talking about subsidy just because of nothing. As far as I'm concerned, subsidy is not our problem. Our problem is about lack of it's, it's corruption. So, did you say subsidy is not our problem? So you would rather that we continue to pay these excessive amounts of money trying to help us, even though it's no. killing us. You'd rather that we continue to pay subsidies instead it, of removing it. It's not. It's not, it's not killing us. We are allowing to kill us. You, you say subsidy is killing us because you, the, ex, ex, the excuse is that look, few people are, are, are taking our money and they're not using it for our benefits. Is that, is, that, is that not what they are saying? Who are these three people? Are they, are they bigger than the country? Do you, do you know them? Can they be punished? If, if, if that money is an individual money by a president or person in power, and he gives it to uh, 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 myself, for instance, go and do this for me, and I didn't do it, what will happen there after? Will he be looking at me? Will you find a way, a, a way around it and say, let's go and do, uh, let's, go and, let's go and carry out, uh, let Nigeria suffer just because three people are, so, in other words, so what if I'm you that, say that subsidy is not our problem, what is our problem? I just want to if hear we this. Fight, if we if we fight, if we if we are able to fight the corruption and lack of accountability and transparency in that corruption and that subsidy, we will get it right. Subsidy will be beneficial to all of us because we are not able to we are not getting benefit from it as 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 it is because there is corruption in it because there is lack of transparency mm -hmm. in it there is lack of accountability in it. We can you cannot tell me. The, that the figure they are giving us is the actual figure we are spending. Because you, can't, you, can't, you don't know the number of crude that's been carrying out. You don't know the number of crude that's been sold. We have been told that our crude have been sold uh, outside the country, or our fuel have been sold outside the country. Do they fly to that, those other country? Are they not passing through our road? Corruption everywhere. And that's why we are not, we are not... So if we are able to fight the corruption inside it, we're able to get it right. Then what we are doing is so call the aid because we are having edic. That's why I see it. In, in as much as... Mm. What, is, what is the guarantee? That the money that will be saved from this subsidy will be used for the purpose they said they will use it for. Because I remember in 2016, same 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 issue was raised, and the, 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 when when the fare was increased from uh, 97 or so, or it's something to 145, what we are told that the money that will be that that, that will accrue from the excess will be used to develop our uh, education, to develop our heads, to deliver our road. Today, has that been done? Where is the money? Who are who are taking the money? The so question is, did we accrue any money um, in all of those years? But let me toss to you. Because it looks like you want to disagree. I'd like to hear your thoughts. The, 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 the concept of the subsidy is a complete red herring. Why do I say so? What would we be doing if we didn't have a drop of oil? Hmm. 
what would we be doing if we didn't have a drop of oil? Would we all suddenly fall to the ground and die? What would we do if all the oil wells were suddenly tainted and we couldn't produce oil? The problem is the, the oil, not the subsidy on the oil. People around us, whether we're all across the West African coast, are paying roughly 700 naira per liter. Are we saying that because we were God, we were God given that we're suddenly snowflakes in hell? Of course we're not. We're lazy. We're lazy because of the oil. If the oil was taken away tomorrow, we would find different ways to generate revenue. So whether there's a subsidy, you call it a subsidy, or you don't call it a subsidy, it's something that is icing on top of the cake. And we should treat it that way. Because if we treat it that way, we become competitive worldwide. We produce things that are costing worldwide. We, 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 we try to sell things abroad that are sellable worldwide. But while we have this subsidy or no subsidy, while we even have the oil, we're all beholden to it. We only talk about oil. I mean, that has to be madness. The 194 mm. countries in the world, how many of them have oil? Do they all suddenly die every year and come back and be resurrected or what? The oil mm. is the problem. There is no problem with the subsidy. We should pay world prices and we should give the profit into building infrastructure. But, but, but you see, this is a question that Tony is asking. Where's the money? Um, because you see, just as you said, that we're blessed with oil and if we... But that we're also a country that's blessed There's several other things. Unfortunately, like you have said, we don't pay attention to those things. We only pay lip service and, you know, do photo ops with people in those, um, within those sectors. And then we leave it and still go back to oil as our mainstay. And it's a legit question you're asking. If we didn't have oil tomorrow, we woke up and everything's dried up. Would we not turn to something else? But do we have to wait for the oil to dry up? For us to be able to start thinking in other directions. The presidency, um, the Bahari administration came up with some rice idea. And I'm still quite wondering, what's the rice? Where is the it? Rice, the borders the were shot. Uh, and all of these things still didn't change. So Bahari, why? The Bahari regime did not come up with a rice idea. The Bahari regime came up with an idea to quell insurrection in the north. We spent one point something trillion naira making sure that people were not unemployed because the unemployed people were going over to Boko Haram. It wasn't, we, if we really wanted to do rice production, we would not do it at a subsistence level. We would do it at a mechanized level. So what we were really mm. doing was placating. We spent one point something trillion naira placating in what we call palliatives in keeping people busy so that while we were trying to build other things around them so that they would not be unemployed and say, um, all Western education is bad, and therefore I'm going to Boko Haram. That's what we did for eight years, and that's why you can't see a, a significant difference in, in food production. You Nobody does, nobody spends that sort of money these days doing subsistence farming. If you wanted to really bring the country forward and compete with the competitors in those other 194 countries, you would be doing mechanized farming. But mechanized farming doesn't work in the north because the farmers don't have the education to use the tractors and all the mechanized things. It's only people like Dangote and Co. that are, and that are able to do that mechanized farming at that level. So what we were really doing was, subs was um, subsidizing um, the, putting palliatives in place for people who otherwise would have nothing to do. And I don't think it was a very good use of money. We should have been using them to educate them, to do, to put into, get into other businesses, other, other things, because now we're still back at the same point. Are we going to continue giving palliatives so that we, they don't have, that, that, so they're not even unemployed? Or what are we going to do? Mm. Great, great question. I spoke to a spokesperson of the newly sworn in Kanu state governor, who is obviously a member of the new Nigerian People's Party, uh, first NMPP governor that uh, Kanu state has had. And one of the things that he raised, the issues he raised, was the fact that there's a lot of um, drug abuse um, in Kanu state and several other environments. And that is also as a result of the fact that these young people are idle. Um, so, Tony, let me toss to you. Um, 
we have a very useful population, something that the likes of the United Kingdom can boast of. Um, and it's supposed to be a blessing for us, but it's more of a curse for us. Um, and for all of the campaigns that we heard um, in the past months before inauguration, everybody was saying we're going to do something for youth employment, underemployment, et cetera, et cetera. And looking at the statistics of unemployment and underemployment, we have more underemployment and it's, con it's continued to rise. Um, and it's young people that it's mostly affecting. Um, and just as I said, there's, there's so many aspects of our economy that needs to be explored, but we're yet to explore it. How can our young people uh, benefit from the vast, um, I'm, I'm looking at the, the blessings that Mother Nature has given this country, and how can governments help for these people to explore and probably build these aspects of our economy other than oil and gas, and of course, the breaking of pipelines. Mary Han, we cannot be doing we cannot be doing the same thing the same way and expect different results. We have not been doing anything different from what we have been doing before, and we can't see different results in that regard because we are not creating anything. We are not creative at all. There is nothing nothing is being created. We are still importing. We are, we are still importing uh, 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 things as little as uh, uh, matches and uh, even as uh, toothpick. So if you are not producing, you are not doing anything. You are not creating. Anything, how do you create job? There is no way you can create job. The government is not thinking outside the box. We are just looking at what is on ground and looking at. To me, oil is not the cost. It's not a cost for us. There are countries that don't have, they have only oil, and there are countries better today. They are doing well because are, it's been managed for the benefit of the, all, all, all of them. But in our own case, some people are just so selfish, greedy, and they want to, on their own, use it for their own personal benefit alone. And that's, 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 that's been our problem. If you think outside the bus, uh, uh, outside the bus, do things different way from what, what we're doing now, we're, not, we're just consuming, we're not producing, we're not doing anything. We're not manufacturing anything, and you, you and you expect anything to, any, any employment to come up. Nothing will come up. There is no, there is no, there is no, nothing will come up it, we, until we have production, until we have manufacturing uh, in Nigeria the way we have it in the, in the early 60 or so. We may not be able to go get any 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 employment uh, 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 anywhere because uh, how, do, how do we get employment when they are, when, when things are not are not working? When there are no even even where in the area where we need uh, uh, people personnel in, in terms of security, we are not engaging. People are not there. We are not. We are, not, we are just complaining every time. And we don't have the numbers yet. We are not. We are not. We are not. We are not, we are not recruiting. We are not doing anything. So we need to think. The government, those in government, need to think outside the box. They need to think uh, how to go do away from uh, uh, this consumption attitude, to so production and manufacturing attitude. Until we start doing that, mm -hmm. we there may not be uh, what's it called uh, in, enough uh, employment for not uh, even uh, fifty percent employment for for, for, our, for our youth. And again, let me just go back to the subsidy issue that we're talking about. Because people often talk about uh, other country where they sell oil above uh, the, the fair price above uh, uh, 1700 or whatever. In those countries, do they, I, I want to ask the question, do they provide security for themselves? Do they provide electricity for themselves? Do they provide light for themselves? Do they, do, don't they have affordable education and ads? In Nigeria, we don't have all those things. The only thing we seem to benefit, as far as I'm concerned, is this so-called uh, subsidy. I so-called because, as far as I'm concerned, even though, even though they may, it may be something may exist, it may not exist. I don't know because I don't know the number of uh, crude we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are producing every day. I don't know what we are consuming mm. every, every day. What we have been told is what, are, okay. what we are hearing that we are spending trillion of dollars mm. on the subsidy. That's what we are hearing. Nobody knows it. You can't. You can't. There's no transparency. That's what accountability on it. So as far as I'm concerned, if we are not doing that, if if, if in fact if we continue this way, if we have 10, 10 source of income and we are behaving the way we are behaving, we are, won't grow. Nothing. Will, nothing will change. Because until we wow. change our attitude about selfishness and greedy, and, and greedy, we will not, we must have the attitude of our people, our people, not me, not me, not what we are having today is me, 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 not people, people, people. Until we have that culture okay. of uh, I must serve my people. That's when we're going to get it right. Well, Ade, uh, Tobatele, and Tunji uh, Adulamid are still here. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be looking at the, um, Tilly administration and how much willpower it might have going forward and how it, it might be ready to deal uh, with the issue of um, cost of governance. Is this going to be uh, a very uh, flamboyant government or are we going to see a lot of heads rolling because of corruption? Let's move to um, the Tilly administration. Um, it's been a week now since um, the president took to power. Um, one of the first things that he said was um, that subsidy is gone. And we have seen the rippling effect of that statement, that simple statement he made 
uh, during his inaugural speech. Now, we're also seeing him giving orders um, to the EFCC, and um, uh, he's also, you know, said that the NLPC has to probe oil thieves and all of the people who have one way or the other been bleeding um, the oil and gas sector. I think um, we've seen presidents come and go and, you know, talk tough on these issues, and yet nothing came out of it. At the end of last year, um, the NMPC had zero um, amount of monies in the national coffers. Now, they, they could say that that's because the NMPC has become a limited liability company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but how serious do you think the body language of President Tinubu is in fighting the corruption that is in, um, in the oil and gas sector? One of the um, characteristics that we've noticed about um, Bola Tinubu as he has come along is that he hasn't got any deputies. He has an awful lot of people that he can rely upon, but he doesn't have any deputies. His word is the will of the party or the way in Lagos state, there wasn't um, a Bola Tinubu deputy who you could run to and say, go and talk to the, um, the, the other guy. Um, can, can, can we negotiate? Uh, I don't think that giving him more power is going to give him less of a, of a resolve. I think that once he makes up his mind, he surrounds himself with people who will execute that, that job and he just gets on with it. Um, irrespective of whether you complain about it or not. The um, executive power at the presidency level is, is an enormous thing. And I think he understands the power that he has. And he understands that, um, like he said, I'm going to remove the subsidy. You can protest and you can protest, but it's not going to change my mind. I think he said that, or words, to this, or words to that effect, before he got there, before he had the power. Now he has the power. What we're asking ourselves is, is he going to water himself down? I don't think so. I think this is a man that has suddenly decided that he has a second chance at building his legacy. I think he, um, whatever, however he got there, um, I think that not many men at the age of 70 or above get that second chance to rewrite their own history. And I think he's very mm. cognizant of that point. And I think he wants to go down um, saying that he was the best president. He may not have been the best person to get there, but having got there, he is the best president. And I, I wrote a piece on LinkedIn that was saying that I think that Bola Tinubu is really much going to be a poacher turned gamekeeper. Um, and I was going to surprise a lot of people in that um, he's going to um, do things that will, will, will surprise the people he, he rose up with. And really much, for example, he's gone to the Senate today and says that he wants 20 advisors. That's why we haven't had the advisors. Everybody's wondering, why hasn't he appointed anybody? Well, he's following the rule of law. I mean, you know, this isn't something that we might have expected. We might have expected that he just started doing special advisors willy-nilly. But he got he got a, a ruling from the Senate today that 20 special advisors could be done. So I would imagine that in the next 24 hours, we'll get names of 20 advisors. I think he really does want to rewrite his own history. And that he's going to take that opportunity to move Nigeria forward and say that I was different. Mm. Uh, today. Uh, many people um, would say that would question um, the election that threw up uh, Ebola Ahmed Tinubu, even though um, the tribunal is still sitting on this matter. But he is president, and just like Ade has said, um, he's swung into action, he's hit the ground running. But the issue of corruption is going to continuously um, be with us if something is not done. And I ask you, just as I asked Ade, is he the man for the job? Uh, I mean, I have, I have a, a, a doubt as to that uh, whether or not uh, we'll be able to fight corruption the way we are looking at it. Because uh, himself uh, has a lot of allegations of corruption against him, and he has a lot of people around him that, that have been alleged of corruption. There are so many of them. Even the current, uh, the person being touted to be the president, the president now, is it's, it's facing allegations of corruption with the FCC. He has so many of them. Those who are almost all of the people around him are facing one corruption or the other. So if you are, if you are, if you have people around you who are facing corruption. How do you fight it? How do you fight other people outside when you are not fighting people around you? So if you are surrounded by people who are who have one one issue or the other in terms of corruption with you, they are working for you, they are for your family, they are your uh, friends, they are your this and that. How do you now fight it? You can it will be difficult for you to fight. And again, bearing in mind that look, 
from for me, I told you that I know he's a politician and his own interest is about capturing the, the power uh, which he has captured now for now. And he's still interested in capturing uh, the power in the, uh, or retaining the power. He's thinking of 2027. And I, and I tell you, all the appointment I will be making now will be geared towards that achieving that, uh, that aim. Because most people that, 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 that will be in part of this uh, uh, government will be, will, you, you, you will either be former governor, former minister, former senator, former senator or rep, or people who have occupied one position or the other will be the one that... But, but does, that, does that not have a plus, being that these people have been in government before, so maybe it'll be easier no, for them to do the job as opposed to having no offices? I'm just asking. What I'm driving at is that, look, what are the people that, that, that have been alleged to be, that, that have been in government, that have been continued to be in government in this country? 80% 80 80 of them are facing one allegation or the other in terms of corruption. And that's that, and that's my point. So if you are bringing in people who are who are who we see as people who brought us to where we are, and they are to come and run your government, what do you expect? I'm not going to expect it too much. If I see development, I will, I'll be okay. I, and I, I, I know the Ashwaju government will be far far better than that of a uh, 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 the former president. Uh, uh, what's it called? You can see the way Why? he handled. We can see the way he handled the NSC and the TUC. The proposed uh, uh, strike. If we were to be president, remember the former president, Mama Bubari, maybe today, tomorrow, strike will have, will have, will have commenced because uh, he may not even see anything. We're just looking at them. You can see the way he handled it. So he has that political, he has that character, he has that, 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 too. he has the seed, he has, he has but in terms of fighting corruption, or in terms of, because why, why I'm worried, why, why I can't say uh, 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 with all sense of responsibility is that, look, that, that he will achieve that uh, result is that he's surrounded by people who are facing one allegation of corruption. Or the other, and there is no way you can be surrounded with those kind of people, and you want to fight so, uh, corruption successfully. Because when you throw stone uh, outside, it will eat your people around you. And then they really, except he want have that, he will have that political way to be able to, to be able to deal with people around him. And the way I see it, if you want to deal with people around you, in fact, one of the reasons why why uh, if you have said, look, even if you are proposing a, a part bill as a state president, I would have loved to have it. But because he has he's having an indication of corruption with the FCC, I will not take him. But he's taking him and he's supporting him. So it shows that, look, people who have corrupt, corrupt, uh, corruption uh, allegation may even be part of his assistance. I know, as a lawyer, the allegation is not the same thing as uh, being, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, convicted for, for. Yes. But that, that it shows that well, but once there's an allegation against you, it shows that you are not clean enough. Go and clear yourself of that or those allegations and come back and I will take it. That's, that's why I expect I was thinking they would do. But, but at last, he's supporting the, the man who is, is facing the AFCC, the uh, uh, invitation all the time. Sanjay, I just want to ask the question that I asked the politician over the weekend because, the, uh, you know, everybody says, oh, you need to have people. I think we were talking about the leadership of the, national, the 10th National Assembly and the same issue of corruption uh, arose. And I asked, um, which, how many, what's the percentage of Nigerian politicians, just as you said, um, that are not necessarily corrupt? Because if we have a corrupt system, then it means that we have corrupt politicians and corrupt leaders. So, um, can corruption really fight corruption? It's going to be difficult for you to see. You see, when you talk about uh, generalize it, I'm not going to say that people who have uh, had a position of the other in our country are all corrupt. But you see, the, the way our system is structured, just like uh, Mr. Ade uh, at Batele said earlier, on, that for you to contest election in this country, you need money. You must spend money. So whenever when most of them spend this money, they want to recruit their money. Because the people, when you are contesting elections, I've been there, I've contested, I've, 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 I've run through it. When you are contesting election, people who are, who you want to serve see it as they are doing favor, and then you must pay them money for that favor. That's the way they see it. So you must you must pay money to do. So in other words, you are buying your way to get there. So and that's why most of them when they get there, they want to recoup recoup their their whatever. But what I'm saying that no, it's not, that does not mean everybody they are, they are all corrupt. That does not mean uh, because most of them even without uh, taking money that belongs to the country, the allowance is alone is enough for them to survive. But that may not also be enough because every day you see people in your house. Even as, as I'm sitting here today, today I, I know the, the number of uh, whatever that I, I, I've seen, even though I'm not even in a national assembly or house of assembly or anyway. So it's difficult for you as a politician in this country not to not to be uh, to be tempted to, to to be corrupt because people will even force mm. you to go into that uh, uh, whatever. Except we have we have a system that will check us. You know when we have a system in place. That will, that will make sure you this corruption. What we should do is that, that, that is to put a system in place that will not allow corruption to even take place at all. Fighting it will be difficult. Mm. What we need to do is to mm. make sure it, it, it's, not, it's not happening. Once it happens, is that if you can fight it? 
Uh, back to you, Ade, before we wrap things up here. Um, Nigerians base a lot of things on body language. Where, when it comes to talking about fighting insecurity, we say, oh, we're looking at the president's body language, fighting corruption is the president's body language. Um, we look at body language a lot, uh, but then the personality of the, like I said, when President Muhammad Buhari came in, he topped off. A lot of people um, caught cold when he sneezed back in the day, but um, that that's was just at the beginning you didn't hold till the end so let's give the the new president a hundred days in office what do we see happening um in those few days especially in terms of um his willpower to cause things to you know um start working for example let's leave the issue of the oil subsidy because that's a uh it's a whole kettle of fish and it's a but looking at um the government keeping the ground running as soon as possible. Do we wait for 100 days to begin to decide if he is going to be up to the task or should we start now while it's early in the day? Um, I think that um, Bola Tinubu has a plan. Um, you, don't, you don't sort of plan for 26 years and get to somewhere and not have a plan. And if you know much about him, um, you know that the the politics is the only thing he he does twenty four seven every day. I believe he has a plan, and I believe that um, he's just trying to find people that can execute that plan, knowing that he can't do it on his own. Um, and so I have I have confidence that something will be done. Whether what is done is the right thing is a completely different um, question. Only he knows his plan because he hasn't told us his plan, apart from the Agbado army and, 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 and a lot of memes like that. Um, and those are, those, are not real, those are not real things that are going to take the country forward. But you do not plan for 26 years to get to a seat and not have an idea of what you would do when you got, when you got there. And I think that over the, over the next week or two, those plans are suddenly going to get rolled out. My only fear is this. Does he have a plan for everyone? Does he have a plan for the north? Does he have a plan for the east? It would be obvious that he might have a plan for the southwest, but does he have a plan for the south-south? And if he doesn't have these plans, who are going to bring these plans to him that are going to be able to be executed in a way that doesn't become just another jamboree? He can take, mm. once you've got your own plans, you know how to, how to keep them in reign. When you're taking on board other people's plans, you may not have that same sort of control over it. Um, and so far, he has not elucidated to anybody what the plan for the Northeast is, what the plan for the Northwest is, what the plan for the South-South or the East is. And that is, my, that is my worry. I have no doubt whatsoever that he would have a definite plan for the Southwest. But we need the plans for Nigeria, not just geographical regions. Mm. Well, I want to say thank you, Ade. I told, I told I tell it. <laughs> thank you so much for speaking with us. I will get used to being able to pronounce this thing just like that. Mm -hmm. I also also say thank mm -hmm. you. Tindy <laughs> Abdulami, uh, thank you so much for being part of the conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you all. And that's the show tonight. Don't forget to follow all our programs on Fast TV Africa on YouTube. Like, subscribe, and follow our previous episodes. That way you can play catch up. I am Mary Ann Cohn. Thank you for watching. Have a good evening. <laughs>